When someone plays make-believe with a real gun in a real-life workplace, and while playing make-believe with that gun violates the cardinal rules of firearm safety, people's lives are endangered, and someone could be killed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's what this case is about. It's simple, it's straightforward. The evidence will show that someone who played make-believe with a real gun and violated the cardinal rules of firearm safety is the defendant, Alexander Baldwin. You will hear over the course of the next few days that in the fall of 2021, a movie called Rust began filming at the Bonanza Creek Ranch just south of Santa Fe in Santa Fe County. You will learn that this movie was a Western with a lot of gun action. And while it was a movie set, it was a real life workplace for many people. But you will hear this workplace was on a tight budget. And you will learn that some of the people who were hired to work at this workplace were very inexperienced. And one of those was the armorer, a very young woman named Hannah Gutierrez Reed. You will hear testimony from crew members who worked on the set, who will tell you that to them, Ms. Gutierrez's inexperience was obvious. You will also learn that this workplace has some talented people. And one of those was the director of photography, a vibrant 42-year-old rising star named Helena Hutchins. You will also learn that the director of this film was Joel Souza, another talented individual who cares deeply for his projects. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that like in many workplaces, there are people who act in a reckless manner and place other individuals in danger and act without due regard for the safety of others. That, you will hear, was the defendant, Alexander Baldwin, the lead actor on this film. You will learn that this movie began filming on or about October 6, 2021. But the defendant did not arrive on set to begin working until about October 13. And you will learn that prior to arriving on the set to work, he requested to be assigned the biggest gun available. So he was assigned this revolver, a replica of an 1873 single action revolver manufactured by Pieta Firearms in Italy. You will hear from Alessandro Pieta, who will tell you he manufactured this gun. And he will tell you he manufactured it in 2015. And he will explain the quality control measures that Pieta Firearms follows in order to ensure that firearms that are manufactured by Pieta Firearms don't have any problems or issues. Mr. Pieta will tell you that this firearm he himself manufactured. And that when Pieta sent it to EMF, which is the company that distributes firearms for Pieta Firearms in the United States, this gun was in perfect working condition. You will hear from Justin Neal, who is a representative of EMS, EMF, excuse me, a company out of California that has historically been known to provide firearms to the movie industry. Mr. Neal will tell you that when EMF received this firearm in 2017, it was in perfect working order. And in fact, when EMF had this firearm, it was subjected to numerous quality control inspections because it was used as a show gun at gun shows. The evidence will show that 
In September of 2021, an individual by the name of Seth Kenny was contacted by the folks with Rust Production. They asked Mr. Kenny if he, was, he would be able to provide some firearms for the filming, for use during the filming of Rust. You will learn that Mr. Kenny owns PDQ Firearm and Prop. It's a duly licensed firearms dealership. Mr. Kenny then contacted EMF and ordered several single action replica revolvers. And in September, or on September 29, 2021, Mr. Kenny purchased this gun. And you will hear that Mr. Kenny received it from EMF and it was in perfect working order. The only thing that Mr. Kenny did to this gun was to insert the firing pin because since it was a show gun, it didn't have a firing pin. But you'll learn that that's a very easy step. All he had to do was just insert the pin and that's it. And then Mr. Kenny had the firearms, this one and some other firearms, transferred to the set of rust at the Bonanza Creek Ranch. And on October 13th, 2021, the defendant was supposed to have a training session with this gun and this young armor. But you will see that during this training session, the defendant had somebody or a couple of people filming him while he's running around shooting this gun. You will learn, ladies and gentlemen, or you'll hear during this trial, the use of the words prop gun. And you'll learn a prop gun is this real gun. It's not a toy. It's not made of rubber, it's a real gun. You will also see evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that during the days before that fateful October 21st day, the defendant handled this firearm multiple occasions. You will see video footage of the defendant firing this firearm, working perfectly fine. But you'll see evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that each time the defendant handled this firearm, he did not do a safety check with that inexperienced armorer. And you'll hear that the reason he didn't do a safety check is because he didn't want to offend her. The evidence you will see will paint a real life picture of a real life workplace where this defendant mishandled this gun. You will see him using this gun as a pointer to point at people, to point at things. You will see him cock the hammer when he's not supposed to cock the hammer. You will see him put his finger on the trigger when his finger's not supposed to be on the trigger. You will hear about numerous breaches of firearm safety with this defendant and this use of this firearm. And the evidence will show that on the morning of October 21st, 2021, the camera crew walked off set. And you will learn that one of the reasons that camera crew walked out is because they were concerned over safety breaches with the use of firearms. The evidence will show that the morning of October 21st started out a couple of hours behind. They filmed some scenes at this church on the Bonanza Creek Ranch. And you will see that one of those scenes required the defendant to pull out his gun. This was in the morning. Pull out his gun. And you'll hear the director tell him, pull it out and hold it. And the first time, you'll see evidence the defendant does what the director tells him. But you're, you will hear the director tell you that many times the defendant would do his own thing. So then the director in the morning asked him, okay, do it again, just like you did now. The defendant pulls out the gun, but this time he cocks the hammer. The evidence will show they then broke for lunch. And at around 1.30 or so, they came back to this church 
to do what's called a blocking. The evidence will show that Ms. Hutchins wanted to do a blocking for an insert. And you will learn what a blocking is, just working out the details of the moves of the actor. It wasn't even a rehearsal. You will hear from one of the witnesses who walked into the church and saw the defendant kind of playing with his gun. And then you will see evidence or hear evidence that Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza were talking to the defendant about doing this insert. And the insert was just supposed to be from here to here. And it was supposed to be of the defendant just slowly taking his gun out of this holster, out of his holster, and just holding it at an angle. The evidence will show that someone asked the armorer to bring the defendant's gun to him. And she did. She brought it into the church, showed it to David Halls, who you will learn is, was the first assistant director. The gun was empty. Ms. Gutierrez then handed the gun to the defendant. But then you will hear that Ms. Gutierrez was given the gun back, and she took it and loaded it with dummy rounds. And what you will learn is that dummy rounds are inert rounds. They look like real, real rounds, but they are very easy to tell that they are not because they'll rattle. Ms. Gutierrez then went back to the church, showed the revolver to the first assistant director very fast. They only checked about three rounds, very quick. And they missed one round. You will learn that one of the rounds in that revolver was a real round. And the evidence will show that Ms. Gutierrez then handed the gun to the defendant. And what you will learn is that once again, the defendant failed to do a gun check or a safety check with this armor. So he takes the firearm, puts it in his holster. Then Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza were doing this blocking. And the evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that the defendant, again, did his own thing. You will hear from an individual by the name of Kent Jorgensen. Mr. Jorgensen will tell you that he's been involved in drafting and revising movie set safety rules. You will learn that these movie set safety rules require actors like the defendant to treat every firearm as though it's loaded, to never point a firearm at another person, and to never put your finger on the trigger unless you're prepared to shoot or to destroy whatever's in front of you. The evidence will show that on October 21st, 2021, after that lunch break, the defendant once again violated those set safety rules. And during this blocking, the director had instructed him to just slowly take out that gun and just hold it at an angle. But you will see that the defendant takes it out quickly the first time, points it. And you will hear witness testimony who will tell you the first time he does it, his finger is on or around the trigger. He does it again, takes it out very fast, points it, and once again, you will hear testimony that his finger was on or around the trigger. And the evidence will show that that third and fatal time, he takes it out once again, fast, hammer's cocked, he cocks the hammer, points it straight at Ms. Hutchins, and fires that gun sending that live bullet right into Ms. Hutchins' body. You will learn that this bullet was a 45 caliber round that entered Ms. Hutchins' body right underneath her right underarm. It perforated her right lung. It traveled through her spine, lacerating her spinal cord, and then it exited 
on the left side of her back. That bullet then went into Joel Souza's right shoulder and it came to rest in his back from where doctors removed it once he was transported to St. Vincent's Hospital here in Santa Fe. You will learn, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Hutchins did not have the same fate. You will see the aftermath of the shooting and you will see medics frantically working to save Ms. Hutchins, <coughs> to stabilize her, to transport her, to airlift her to UNM Hospital. But the damage from that bullet was too much. Ms. Hutchins succumbed to her injuries and bled to death. The evidence will show that meanwhile, after the shooting, the defendant began to claim he didn't pull the trigger. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that's not possible. You will hear from Mr. Pieta himself who will tell you that gun will not discharge without a pull of the trigger. You will hear from firearms experts who will tell you that gun will not discharge without a pull of that trigger. The evidence will show that law enforcement officials arrived at the scene on October 21st after the shooting and immediately took this gun into their custody. Then later, they asked the FBI for assistance in processing this gun for forensics and examination. You will learn that the gun and some ammunition that was taken from the set and from PDQ arms were sent to the FBI for analysis. You will learn that the gun first went to the DNA section of the lab where a DNA analyst found the defendant's DNA on this gun. And then the gun was transferred to the firearms and tool mark section of the lab where a firearms examiner examined this gun very carefully and closely. Bryce Ziegler, who is the firearms examiner for the FBI, will tell you that when he received this firearm, he first examined it. He didn't see any defects, didn't see any modifications. He tried and he checked the hammer in the three different positions, cocking positions. He checked the quarter cock position, fine. Checked the half cock position, fine. Checked the full cock position, fine. And when he held it in the full cock position, you will hear that hammer held until he pulled the trigger. You will also hear that Mr. Ziegler test fired this gun 12 different times. And each time that gun fired as it was designed. Each time when he pulled that trigger, it fired. And he will tell you that not once did this gun malfunction or discharge on its own. Now the evidence will show that because the defendant had been claiming that he didn't pull the trigger, Mr. Ziegler suggested one last test to the Sheriff's Department. Mr. Ziegler told the Sheriff's Department that he could do what's called an accidental discharge test. He obtained authorization to do this test and you will hear that he left that test for last because that test <coughs> could potentially damage the gun. Mr. Ziegler went forward after he received this authorization and conducted the accidental discharge test. And you will hear, ladies and gentlemen, that during that test, a couple of the internal components of this firearm damaged. You will hear that the trigger sear and the full cock hammer notch were damaged during the accidental discharge testing. <coughs> the evidence will show, however, that before this accidental discharge testing by the FBI, this gun functioned and worked perfectly fine. You'll see the video footage of the multiple occasions during which the defendant used this firearm on the set, and each time he fired it, it was working just fine. And in fact, you'll hear <coughs> evidence that the defendant himself admitted in December of 2021 that this gun 
didn't have any mechanical problems. You will hear from the two of the country's leading experts on firearms forensics, Michael Haig and Lucian Haig. And they will tell you that they examine the revolver and the damaged pieces extensively. They will tell you that the damage to the full cock trigger notch is consistent with the accidental discharge testing that was conducted by the FBI. Lucian Haig will tell you that in August of 2023, he examined the trigger sear, the other piece, and that when he looked at it initially with the naked eye, there was nothing wrong with it. He couldn't see anything. But then he put it under the microscope and he noticed some kind of rough microscopic diagonal lines on the surface of the trigger sear. And since at the time he did not know how Mr. Ziegler had conducted the accidental discharge test, he opined that these very small microscopic lines were likely not caused by the FBI accidental discharge testing, but he could not exclude that as the source of those lines. Then a few weeks ago, Mr. Haig will tell you that he spoke with Mr. Ziegler and he learned how Mr. Ziegler had conducted the accidental discharge test. Mr. Ziegler explained that he affixed that firearm onto a fixed platform and then struck the firearm on six different planes with a rubber mallet. And Mr. Ziegler explained to Mr. Haig that he had not affixed the mallet to another fixed device. Instead, he did it freehand. Mr. Haig will tell you with his 50 plus years of experience as a forensic, firearms forensics expert, he opined or concluded that those very tiny microscopic diagonal lines on the surface of the trigger sear were likely caused by the FBI's accidental discharge test. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that regardless of how those tiny microscopic lines got on that trigger sear, these firearms experts will tell you that those would not affect the functionality of this firearm. At the end of this case, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to conclude and be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that on October 21st, 2021, that gun the defendant had asked to be assigned worked perfectly fine as it was designed and that the fatal and one of the main problems that afternoon of October 21st was that the defendant didn't do a gun safety check with that inexperienced armorer. He pointed the gun at another human being, caught the hammer, and pulled that trigger in reckless disregard for Ms. Hutchins' safety. And you will be convinced that the only true and just verdict in this case, so that true justice can be served, is a verdict of guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Thank you.